Aloha kako. Aloha. How's everybody today? Okay, so this is going to be a real informal kind of talk story. Um, Ho'i kapili na kai, which is um, re-establishing our relationships to our oceans. It's kind of a, if you want to put it into an English terminology, it's kind of a marine resource management um, malama aina kind of talk story. Um, and I just threw this presentation together last night this morning, so if it's out of order, I just want to get through them. So I work... Uh, Hoikopilinakai actually was my master's thesis at UH Manoa out of Hawaiian Studies. Um, and it kind of grew, uh, grew out of oh, a lot of things, but my childhood, born and raised on Kauai, um, and spending a lot of time in the ocean, surfing, sailing, um, just being at the ocean a lot because of my parents. So now being a parent myself, how our relationship to our oceans, being at the beach with children, having them not understand what, what's there, was kind of the first stepping stone to getting into where we're at today. So having, looking at, listening to children talk about fish, talk about how they eat fish, how they don't eat fish, how they swim, how they're scared of the ocean, all of that kind of stuff kind of was that first um, aha for me to get here. So. Uh, I graduated in 2011 with my master's degree on um, kind of really looking at relationships and, and the ocean. And how do we get back to a relationship where we are, we are sustainable and we are healthy and we kind of look at everything. So I work, I'm out on the Big Island right now. I work with a great group of students at UH Hilo and also with a nonprofit called Namaka Okapaha Namoku Akea, which really looks at our archipelago as a whole archipelago from Hawaii to Kure. So we get like 50 islands, you know, in our archipelago, not just eight, yeah? So our archipelago stretches across a distance past Washington to Texas kind of thing. We are that big, and we have that much aina to, to Malama, and that's the kuleana here. So just bear with me. Um, when we went into it, I work with Native Hawaiians in STEM, so that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And I try to get as much Hawaiians into those fields, but it didn't make sense to get a whole lot of brown people doing a whole lot of white stuff, yeah? That doesn't solve the problem. So, we, we try to get as much Native Hawaiians to be able to be bilingual in STEM. They understand, they can function in that world. We, be, they become our professionals, but they also know where their kuleana is, yeah? So the question that we, we ask, you know science, you gotta ask your question, what is your question? So the, the question we ask is our, our cultural question. And that's one of the ways we integrate and we become our own scientists, our own technology people, our own engineers. It's how, it's ask, answering that cultural question. And our cultural question is, how do we know our environment so well that when we interact with it, it's healthy and sustainable? And that leads our journey. So one of the biggest things is you have to be present and pay attention. You cannot read books, read articles, hear what Tutu said about in place, and know about the place. You have to be there, but you cannot just be there because as we grow through life, you know, as children, the beach was our play place, yeah? We would surf, we play in the sand, and that's perfect. That's where relationships start as playmates. But they have to mature and evolve to become sustainable, and they have to be balanced that way. So we have to learn how to pay attention after that. Not only as children, but when we evolve into adults, that relationship matures into that. So being present and paying attention is a really, really big deal, actually. So. You know, what's happening on our shorelines? Going, not only when calm, going when it's really, really rough and kind of spooky because that's a characteristic of place that you need to understand or we need to understand in order to know the place. This is the same papa on, um, out on the big island and it's how it's changed through time. So March, look how we call it our ulu vehi vehi. That's the vehi oke kai when it's really, really just productive and just going off and then March, May, it's kind of dying down already. June and October. So we have that cycle and that really, really small cycle and a really, really small piece of, of papa. And understanding that and how that affects 
your practice, how that affects what you harvest, when you harvest it. But part of knowing characteristics of place. Everybody's into the sun, yeah? Where the sun set? Let's go out September 22nd, watch the solstice and equinox and all of this stuff. But what does that mean? Right? You can go out there and you're going to do your oli, you're going to do your protocol, and you're going to hold mana, that relationship. But what does that relationship mean to your practice? So for us, in one of the places we practice, this is what the sun means to us. Summer solstice, it's all the way over here. We have long days. It's really, really dry. We have pretty calm, calm weathers. And it, so when the sun is coming up from that part of Mauna Kea, that's Mauna Kea, that opihi looking thing. <laughs> when it's on the left side of Mauna Kea, we, we do certain things. And when we see it starting to drift over to Kofiko Wake, which is due east for our place of practice. And that's special for us. It doesn't have to be special for anybody else, but that's special for us. But when it does that, then we know, okay, okay, we got to prep. The wind, waves going to come, so it's going to change our shoreline a certain way, so we have to change our practice, right? And then it goes all the way to the south, winter solstice. As soon as it hits that pool or by that pool, we know, okay, it's coming back this way. So how does that mean to our practice? How do we change what we do? And then our sunset. We are at a site in, um, in North Kona that funded by the rich people at Kaupulehu. So I have beautiful lawn and everything. So we get bathroom and everything, so sleep bad. But they planted tea leaves. And it just so happened, the northern tea leaf that they planted is right on our summer solstice. So we told them they cannot touch them because that's our, that's our mana mana. So we have a pana now we set up. We never, you know, just the wall. We just put our backs to a certain place on the wall and we just watch the sun. But because that's what our practice is, yeah? And then we develop, okay, because we come from STEM and academics, we gotta, you know, write it down and create database and be able to analyze and all of this stuff. But we came and started to do this huli ia sheet. And it was just something that we were playing around with, okay, we have to document. We know we have to document, but we know we have to document everything. So how are we going to do that? So we came up with this. And then it kind of looks confusing, but it's Lani Honua Kai. And then we add to it, it's evolved a little bit more since we made this one. But what's happening in the clouds? Are there low clouds, medium clouds, high clouds? Are they stretched? Are they brown? Are they gray? Are they, are they fluffy? Are they um, Nike swishes? You know, all of that stuff tell a certain story. Which way is the wind coming from? Did it switch? When did it switch? All of that stuff. And this process has taught us how to pay attention. But what we figured out was, if everybody does it individually, you're not learning nothing. So we have a data sheet, and how we use this is we use it as a discussion to help us pay attention. And you figure, get how many people in this room? Maybe 20, 25? If every single one of us got to go to the beach together, and then we came back to the room and sat down, and all of us saw 90% of the same thing, but 10% nobody else saw, how much more information would you be aware of after the conversation? Right? So if I knew when the wind had switched, and at what direction, and what time, but nobody else noticed that because their bodies are not used to, to paying attention to wind. Tomorrow, everybody in the room would pay attention to wind, right? And if I'm not a bird person, so you guys probably saw all these birds and this and that. And who saw Kolea yet? They came, yeah? This past week was the first one that came to this place. So, Akel. Yeah, so, okay, Koleas are coming, so go look for Kolea. Um, and what that tells us later. But we figured that this could help lead our discussions. So we sit after we go out into the field. We do not put an hour aside every day to observe because that's not what our kupuna did, right? We don't keep journals unless you want to, but we have a discussion. Because if you put aside an hour a day to watch, that means there's 23 hours in the day you're not watching, right? You switch them on, switch them on, switch them on, switch them on. So we go out, we do our thing, do whatever we want, and we come together during dinner or after dinner, and we have a little discussion, 
and we start to learn. So when we started this sheet, we could barely fill it. In two, three months, we had to turn the paper over because never have enough room. So helping us pay attention, learning from everybody's experiences because we observe based on what other people see and what other people are doing, right? We, or what we do. So if we hear everybody's observation and they're adding at least one new idea every single time we talk, that's plenty of information. And we start to teach our brains to remember and our bodies to, to remember how to, to do that with all the six senses. So this is a big deal for us on the process. And then we took this present, being present, paying attention, and we created our own, our own calendar, our own season calendar for the place that we practice. And this is at Kalaimano. So we are... Our wet season starts in November. I don't know about everybody else, but our wet season starts in November. It's when our, all the sugar canes and grasses start to tassel. Our gonads for the opihi, they're starting to reproduce. Our oceans are still calm. But that first column, that's when our ho'uilo starts. And as you progress through the wet season, these things start to happen. So what we figured was this observation sheet we wanted to be able to have these kinds of visual products so we could help tell the story of that place and help share that experience. But then we stumbled across Olelo no Eau, because oh, I should back up. Olelo no Eau, you guys know what that is? Okay, for those that don't, it's wisdom, proverbs, wise sayings, all of those little catchy things that are kupuna passed down. But Olelo no Eau, and we consider them Ike Kupuna, our ancestral knowledge. But one controversial thing that we talk about is, and don't get offended, please, where is the value of our Ike Kupuna? Is it in the Olelo, or is it how they got the Olelo? So for us, it's how they got the Olelo. Because Palakahala Momonakaha Uke Uke, when the hala is blossoming and fruiting and falling off its ahui hala, that's when ha uke uke are fat. That, does that apply today? Does that apply in our place and our time? Because climate change, the Mohala tree sometimes, you know, all of that. So we went, okay, we know it's valuable, but it was valuable for our kupuna. So let's reconfirm to make sure it's still valuable for us today. And where does that lesson come from? It comes from observing over large periods of time to become, to create our, to create those olelo. So we observed over long periods of time, and we also created our olelo to be functional in this time and place. So we're, Ho'oma, we're continuing the practice of observation in the hopes that it's somewhat like our kupuna. It's not totally, because we still can jump in our car, close the windows, and go, yeah? But we also are continuing the practice of haku. And that's something that's really, really important. We need to, that's a practice. That's not, haku did not stop 200 years ago when the first people, came, other people came, yeah? Haku is a continual practice because in five generations, they need their ike kupuna, and that comes from us now. So if we think about it in those terms, we're continuing a practice of haku um, haku olelo no eau. So throughout, scattered throughout the visual timeline of halai mano, of our ho'oilo, is also our olelo no eau that help us capture bits and pieces of knowledge through the season. So what happens in Kalaimano, we have really, really calm. And about January, we have these huge waves that come in. And it's really, really spooky. But we have a shoreline that goes from 0 to 100, 200 feet in like two weeks. And what happens when you have a lot of sea spray, and it's our ho'uilo, so we're actually getting rain in Kona, is you get limu that need the brackish, start growing on the rocks. And now you get limu on the rocks and you have all this constant sea spray, you start getting what <coughs> with limu? You get pakai, yes, but you get fish. You get haupi uke, you get pipipi, you get opihi. We found koele about that size, all the way up by the sand, like far away. Because it got, the, the, um, the waves picked it up from the rocks and just threw it up. And then we have recruitment happening, so the opihi spawned and stuff like that. So we're finding all these babies way high up. But it lasts maybe just three or four months. But that's, these are the months that our kupuna, the big kupuna climano, 
gathered salt, because Kalaimano was a salt gathering place. And I was thinking to myself, why would our kupuna gather salt in the middle of surf season? It's so unsafe, yeah, because we used it to our sandy beaches on Kauai, right? It's so unsafe down at the ocean, and get plenty, plenty of surf, and get water, but until we spent two years straight at this place every single month and looking at these cycles, it made sense. Because now we have 200 feet wide of shoreline to gather from. My children can feed themselves for two months straight down there. I don't need good nothing for them. They can play in the tide pools that are safe, even though the, as, as huge as the waves get. That rock right there was in the ocean at one time. The next day was up here, so that's how rough it can really, really get. Um, they, they can harvest themselves, <coughs> and there's circulation, so you don't need to go far to go get salt, water to make salt, because all the salt pans are high up on the rocks. And you figure, if it's raining plenty Malka, what's happening in the springs? You get more fresh water from the springs, so it'd be a great time to be down collecting from those springs. So, and then this is our Kaubella. And I didn't bring the whole big thing I had on, but it was too big for carrying on the plane. <laughs> so that was one practice. Another practice is turning mana olana into mana oyo. And this is something that comes from Manu Meyer, um, the idea that we kind of picked up and ran with. So mana oyo, um, ideas, concepts, theories, you know, all the things we talk about. Lana is to float, yeah, that float about us. So taking all these ideas, all these theories, all these things that we don't have a grasp on are floating around us and we're turning them into EO is meat, your flesh. We're turning them into the flesh ideas. Things that we do so much, they're ingrained in us. So we collect salt, so we understand that process and the value of salt to us. We fish, because you cannot take care of your marine resources if you're not dependent on it, right? We collect limu, we feed our fish. We do all kinds of stuff. Because through the practice, you understand your relationship, and through the relationship, you understand your kuleana. We also have been making fish traps and baskets. So the cool thing about this is you get another kind of idea of what our natural resources look like. So that's a cane basket right there on the far right. And I would catch nothing but one eel. Yes. I'm still practicing. I'm still trying to get the ego out of this manao. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he took my bait and he left. But <laughs> so I didn't catch him actually. He went in and then he went back out. But that's king. It's usually made of ie ie. But I don't know enough about ie ie to make my basket. So one, do we even have ie ie? We do, but we're finding out people, plant people, and you know, people that work with all this kind of stuff. We're finding out that even if it's in the forest and it's not in our mala, it's still our mala. We have to go and clean the forest, make sure the roots are growing good. Same thing for olona, right? There's plenty of wild olona, but they're finding they cannot make rope out of it because it's not tended, just like wauke. It grows wild, but you gotta go and tend it so you don't have the little stubs coming up, right? So they're finding that out about, you know, Olona, all of these are resources in the mountain that make it possible for us to do this. So that makes us, we have to go back into the forest, yeah? And then, okay, we, so we're supplementing cane, but now we're putting them in, but doesn't mean a fish is gonna swim into it. So now we have to understand about environment, <coughs> habitat, the whole ecosystem, fish behavior, what they're eating, all of that, just to catch a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, our kupuna. <laughs> but once you do that, you start to appreciate, again, back to that pihina, that relationship, and what drives that. I didn't grow up eating opihi and all the shellfish because it was against our religion back then. So I was very late in life to to start this practice. So I'm rediscovering a lot of this, and I cannot eat as much as I would like to because if you eat banana and stuff, you know what it does to your body. But just simply getting banana in a basket, learning how to shake it is one thing. 
by opening it up and learning how to take it out of the its shell in one piece without wasting is another. I'm actually like all of the yummies in there, but I don't, so I don't know pain. And then, how many young people know how to do that? So we come in and we teach young people how to do that. And you know what, it cleans the ocean so not many people don't get poked by one of But at least they're using it for something. And they're reestablishing that connection to this resource. So, manaola na manao iko. Another thing we do is we integrate knowledge systems. Like I said, it doesn't make any sense for a brown person to do a white idea, right? There's no problem solving there. So, but there's value. There's value in STEM. There's value in, in knowledge systems, period. Not only Western, but Filipinos get plenty of knowledge, you know, that happen to them, Japanese, all of the people that live here, too. They have plenty of knowledge. And be, just because it's not in the native Hawaiian, it doesn't mean it doesn't have value. It needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have value. So, but, again, going back to using the knowledge systems to answer cultural questions. So, involving our process and changing the default. I call the default Western science and Western solutions and Western problem solving. That's the default, because we all grew up in the system, so we all default. Like it or not, we all default. Redefining what questions we ask and how we choose to answer them as Native Hawaiians, as fishermen, as community members, as Western science, and as members of our environment. And looking at application function and relevance. So, how do we use Western science to answer cultural questions? This is our OPE life cycle. We have how many types of OPE? We have three types of OPE. Actually four, but three that we can eat. You don't want to eat the fourth one. Is we have Makaya Uli, which is our Blackfoot. It's found on the highest part of the shoreline. We have Ali Nalina, which is the Yellowfoot, or people call it a Lua OPE. And then we have Koele. People think Koele is the Mama OPE that repopulates the whole OPE population. No, <laughs> there's three. So if you leave only the Koele, that means you're still taking just two, right? So, that's the cycle. It releases, and all three do not release at the same time. So they stagger release all of their gonads, so males and females, release it out into the ocean, and they do their thing out in the ocean, and what is that? 12, 12, 3, about 20 days later, they are in a time in their life where they need to find a rock again. And if they don't find a rock again, no more OPE. And they're finding through Western science that if you clean a rock, the chances of resettlement on that rock are slim because mature or bigger OPE, other OPE give off like chemical stuff. And if they don't sense the chemical stuff, they're not gonna settle on that rock. Okay, also, so the pictures top left is a male OPE. They have yellow looking gonads, pua. Females on the right with greenish. And they also have predators besides us, believe it or not. Those two shells on the right and left, one, I don't know the scientific name, but we just call them pupu and makaloa and pu'ab and stuff like that. They actually have a, a little pointy thing and they go up to the OPE and chemically, well, so the OPE can sense it, and the OPE actually, if you ever get a chance to find one of these shells, will take it to an OPE, put it on the OPE, and the OPE will lift up, throw its mantle out, push it off, and run away. Whoa. Yes. So they move quite fast if you get for an OPE. Let's <laughs> ask <laughs> our OPE. The middle is how we okay. So these guys are people are um, they compete for space. But they're also helpers because Opihi can't eat that fast. So all of the limu that comes up, your ha uke uke help keep the grazing down. But if there's not a lot of limu, they can eat all the Opihi food. So there's this huge thing going on. And then that's my hand, and just to show scale of recruitment happening. That's all baby Opihi. 
And most of the baby OP, that's Makaya, will need a black foot because they're higher up. They have these speckles that keep stuff. But understanding these cycles. And also what we do is we take OP. But instead of just eating it, first we take data from it. So we look at the shell width, shell length. We weigh the whole thing. Then we poke it from its shell, and we take just the meat and the gonad. And then we dissect it, we take the gonad, we weigh the gonad. And then on the inside, where the meat is attached, there's a scar, and we measure the length and width of that. And we take that because not only integrating knowledge systems, we integrate disciplines. For anthropology, they look at midden, so all the stuff our kupuna used to eat in the trash pile. And what's left on the OP shells is just that inner scar. They don't have the whole shell. So we take our data for the inside, we have a ratio of what that looks like, what size the outer shell would look like in comparison with the inside ratio, and we can help the anthropologist, archaeologist tell what size that shell started off with before they used it as a scraper or whatever they're using it for. So that. And then we have this Opihi Gonad Index to do it with how Opihi okay, okay as well, which tells us when, oh, I have to that one up. Okay, it tells us, it gives us a little flow chart of when each species is spawning and when their peak moments of spawning. And we know when they're spawning, we know their growth rate. And by knowing all of that, and also knowing what size they are at, at the peak, when they are the most productive in size. Yeah, if they're, if they're about an inch, they might be 20% ratio. But if they're an inch and a half, they're at 40%. We want the inch and a half reproducing more. We have more of those, yeah. And also doing fish surveys. So we got brought in the tide pool because there's a whole lot of stuff happening in tide pools. And also on the outer reef. And these are, um, this is a sheet from the Nature Conservancy and they're doing some work right down the um, coastline from us. But an example of looking at um, culturally important fish of this area, how they're growing, looking at growth rate, looking at presence absence, just so we understand what's happening in that environment because with that information, we know how we're gonna act. Not following regulations, not following what someone else tells us, but by knowing our environment, it'll tell us when to harvest, when not to harvest, where to go, where not to go to keep balance and our practice healthy. So, which leads to changing our practice, right? And this is our relationship. We cannot turn a horn card if we don't know this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's not enough anymore for us, right? So, Opihi, Aama and Refish for commercial use and to some extent parties. We Hawaiian, we like Opihi and Aama at our parties, right? When is party season? Summer. Summer. Yeah? What's happening in summer for Aama? Lobster. Is lobster open or closed? It's closed. Why is lobster closed? It has eggs. So as a crab, most crabs are reproducing at about that time. So our Aama, when we are harvesting Aama for our parties, they're in the middle of reproduction. Opihi. No, we gotta have OP here. No, we don't have to. I know we like OP here at our parties. But you know what? Our kupuna never have 20 parties a weekend per community. And serving 300 to 500, sometimes 1,000 people. So is that our practice? We gotta think about it, right? I, I don't tell anybody. My, the who I work with and a lot of the things we do, we're not trying to stop a practice. Anything but. We're just trying to change it so we can continue to do it over time and our kids can do it. Is bigger really better, size versus production? Okay, Western systems have size limits. I'm getting the time, so I'm gonna go real fast to this. Size, the bigger the fish is, the better the reproduction is. They get more eggs and the quality, genetic quality of the egg is better. So if they're telling us to wait till they reach a, a foot, then we harvest, so we're basically waiting a foot till it reaches reproduction size, and then they're telling us to harvest. What is that telling us about our fish stock? That we are taking the most reproductive stage of a fish out of the system. And potentially changing the whole genetic makeup of our species. Because no mature, not no, little matures, people are, um, fish are getting past that. 
fishing for the freezer, real fast. 25 of us, 30 of us in the room, 25 of us in the room, we all get 20 fish in our freezer. What is that? 400 fish. And you don't eat them the next day, right? Because it's for your freezer. Let's say it sits in your freezer for three months. That's three months that 400 fish do not reproduce. And fish reproduce an average of twice a year. But that's only 20 of us. Imagine how many of us fish for our freezer now. I have a nephew that was going every weekend and filling 10 bags a weekend. He got good schoolings. <laughs> <laughs> how do we malama? Oh, wait. Did I miss a point back there? Yeah. Ooh, another thing. Ooh. You know, we're always told to leave our females and take our males. Well, if you know your species and you know the environment, there's a switch out here for uhu. Uhu males have a harem of a bunch of females, so one male mates with a lot of females. You take the male out, that's a whole lot of females don't mate that year. And then the dominant female within that harem turns into a male. So it takes a whole year for that process to happen too. So if you take one female out of 10, a harem of 10, is there a big impact? No, but if you take the male, yeah. So it's knowing your fish, knowing their reproduction cycle, knowing their habits, knowing what all of that is. So how do we malama? Consider everything. And that's where the relationship comes back to. What is our relationship? It's not a, for me, it's not a natural problem. It's a social problem. But it's a social problem for me as a Hawaiian because that's our practice. And that's our relationship to our aina. We have to allow it to feed us, but in order for it to feed us, we need to take care of it. So, time and place. What's happening now, here and now? What's happening in our environment and understanding the whole picture so we can make better choices. Ike kupuna, the system, not the product. Do you understand that? Cultural practice and transmission of knowledge. If we start doing Western concepts of regulation, like shutting down shoreline, you displace a whole community's practice of that place. And I like to say you're just taking a toy away from a spoiled child. You're not fixing the child. So let's fix our children. Disconnecting communities from place and correcting bad behavior. So that's kind of the last three months together. Um, so it's kind of for Ikopili Nakai, reestablishing these relationships, looking at it from a practice and from a, all of our different kind of relationships but letting that drive us, letting us really go into what does this place to mean to me, what is my relationship with it, how do I know it that every time I interact with it, whether it's to go snorkeling, whether it's to feed my family, whether it's just to go in launa, windsurf, jet ski, boat, whatever I'm doing, I know it so well that my impact is minimal. And that's kind of what drives us. So mahalo, and any questions? Yes. The spreadsheet, um, uh, the first one that you put up for the to, for discussion, you know, the Makadi Namiapa. Sorry, which one? One more. Was it the top or the bottom? Just Lani Honu. Yeah, Lani Honu. This one? Oh. Okay. That is that is so my study. Is there? You know, I can send it. I also have a website, I should put it up, um, if you want to write it down, it's www.hawaii.edu. Can I write down here? Mm -hmm. Yes.
that's the big point. It's learning from each other's experiences that makes this as most valuable. It's not the sheet at all. More the process, though. It's the process you go through. So, but just on bigger scale, we had, I don't know if you guys know Havane Rios. She is part of our group, and she went to Puree for seven months. So we had her do monthly or weekly sheets with the four people that she lived with up there. We did it, we do it on Midway. We did it on Kumanamana Nihoa. Um, French Frigate, we have someone, and then on the Big Island. So we're, and then Kauai did it for some other summer programs. But we're trying to create an uh, uh, efficient way of analyzing, which is really, really hard because it's not quantitative, it's not numbers, it's all of this words and stuff, to find out how our cycles are affecting us across the whole archipelago. So is it a two month between Kira and Hawaii? Is it a lapse in time and on characteristics and behaviors? It's something that we're trying to, trying to do everywhere just so we can start to understand what's happening here. Yes? I don't think I was thinking that I was just running around here from getting here, but how do people participate in keeping the kite? Just go. Just, you know, yeah. And that's only on the island. Um, right now, it's only on the big island just because that's where we are. Um, we have two sites. We have Kalaimano, and we're just starting. Um, we're actually starting to monitor and do an assessment for Kailapa community quite high. They have 72 acres that they're going to turn into a wellness park. So along with um, with our organization and students from UH and, so, and the Nature National Park Service, we're going to be doing a terrestrial marine cultural site assessment of the area and then start to create a management plan that fits that area instead of looking at the other system of, yeah. But yeah, just email me. And then we are coming here to do an orientation on this observation sheet, September 10th. So if you're interested, September 10th, just email me too and I can give you the location. Yeah. There's an exhibition going up to Mokumanamana Nihoa, so if you're interested in learning more about the North Hawaiian Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, um, the team will be at that session, so you can talk start with them too. Is it going to Maui anytime soon? Monday. <laughs> Monday. I'll be there Monday and Tuesday. For what? Uh, meeting. Oh. But then the day I'm free. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, mahalo. Thank you. <laughs>
No. But you just had it. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. <laughs> I have too much shit that I'm carrying around. <laughs> 